the Holy Spirit. The helmet of salvation is our hope in who we are as followers of Jesus. The helmet of salvation protects us by living in that hope. That hope is at the front of our minds. When our thoughts are centered on Jesus, the thoughts of the devil find no place to take hold, man. We can't easily be discouraged if we're filled with hope. And hope is just what God has offered us through Jesus. So the next part of this verse in Ephesians 6, this is incredibly unique. It says, And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So up until this point, we've talked about pieces of armor that are by nature defensive and repel incoming attacks. Here we have a sword which can't be used for defense, but by its nature is an offensive weapon. When we are told that this sword is the word of God. Now in the Roman armor, this sword hung off the belt that was described as truth earlier in this passage. We know that the belt of truth represents God's written word, and here the sword is called the word of God. We know that the sword attaches to the belt, so the spiritual picture here Paul is making is that there is a strong connection between the two. Initially, it would seem like they're the same thing, but they're not. The word for God's written word in the Greek that this was originally written was the word logos. And it meant a lengthy written text. The Greek word used for the sword of the spirit being the word of God is the Greek word rima. And it means a short part that is brought to mind at a particular moment. If I'm thinking about the Terminator and I'm going through the entire movie script, that's logos. If I'm thinking of Oster La Vista, baby, that's Rima, man. That's the Terminator, too. The Terminator's awesome. Jesus is not the Terminator. Jesus is our model for doing life. Of life that though not easy or fair, is victorious and filled with joy. When Jesus was baptized, he received the Holy Spirit, and he was immediately in spiritual warfare with the devil. The devil tried to deceive him by attacking his identity by offering an easy way out, and by attacking his faith in the Father's truth. Every time Jesus rejected those thoughts by quoting a small portion of Scripture. It's worth noting that the devil at one point tried to deceive Jesus by actually using Scripture too. But Jesus knew the Word of God better and more thorough. He knew that what the devil was doing was twisting Scripture and not applying its truth. And Jesus used the truth of God's Word to shut him down. It's also worth noting that Jesus didn't just have a quick encounter with these deceptions and temptations. And I want to take a minute to look at exactly what happened there in Luke chapter 4. And I need both hands to do this. It feels like eternity when there's something happening like that. <laughs> All right, so Luke chapter 4. Jesus has just been baptized. And it says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. 40 days in the Jewish culture did not necessarily mean a specific time around 40 days. 40 days was hyperbole, it was poetic exaggeration, it was a, a way of saying it was a really long time. So Jesus is out there for quite a while. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you were the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment's time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you, and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, this will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, if you were the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He shall give you his they shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. And just because that's the end, 
of where those temptations would spread, that doesn't mean it was ended right there. It says when the devil had ended every temptation, it means that this kept going. And it meant that the devil departed until an opportune time. That opportune time, that is when he attacks us. My goodness. When we're the most vulnerable. And we need to have this sword to fight them off. And man, it simply is not possible to have the Rima if you don't have the Logos. The Holy Spirit isn't going to recall a specific word of Scripture to our mind if we are never putting that word into our minds in the first place. All these verses that we just went through about hope, when we're feeling discouraged and we're feeling hopelessness, that coming into our mind at the right time, that's the difference between falling off the edge of that cliff and getting back up after we've fallen down. We need to fight back because this is a war and it's gonna keep coming whether we fight back or not. If we don't fight back, then we're just gonna get beat down and we're gonna live defeated lives and that is not what God intended for us. Sometimes we do get hurt. Sometimes we do fall. Sometimes we do make mistakes. That's just the way it's gonna be. If you think anything other than that, we would be kidding ourselves, man. But we need to fight back. It is our right, it is our duty, and it is our privilege as children of God. And that is what this sword of the Spirit does. Now, I want to look at a couple cases of some dudes that waged their war very effectively. Someday we're going to be rich and I'm going to have a wireless mic. Christmas present, Carly? <laughs> okay. All right, so I'm going to look at Ezra, first of all. Ezra was this dude who uh, was alive in King Artaxerxes' reign. And what God had put in Ezra's heart was to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, Israel had been captured by Babylon at this point. They were living in captivity. And Jerusalem had been destroyed. So the temple where they worshiped God had been destroyed. So God put it in his heart to go back to rebuild this and to worship God there and for the people of Israel to worship God there. And in these descriptions of Ezra, what it keeps saying about him is that these good things kept happening to him according to the good hand of his God upon him. And then it finally explains why. It says, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. So first he prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. By the very nature, the word seek is tied to study. When you go out to seek an answer, you don't just sit down and wait for it to come to you. It's going to take a lot of effort. It's going to take a lot of study. It's going to be a lot of hard work. So he had prepared his heart to seek the law of God, then to do it, and then to teach his statutes and ordinance to Israel. And that is exactly what we see Jesus doing too. We see the picture of him as a child. His parents can't find him because he's in the temple. Because he's studying God's word. He made a point of seeking it out. And then he did it. He obeyed. He did not question. He unquestionably obeyed. And then he taught others to do it. And that's what he rolled out to them to do too. Seek these things out. Do them. And then teach other people how to do them. Now Ezra petitions Artaxerxes. And Artaxerxes tells him... Yeah, you can go back to Jerusalem, you can rebuild this temple, you can take your people with you, you can worship there. And that wasn't because Artaxerxes was this godly nice dude, it was a, a political move that he made on his part. He allowed people within his kingdom, he allowed conquered peoples to rebuild the places that they had worshipped so that they would be more subservient members 